Uh, there's a lot going on. The biggest story in the country remains exactly what you think it is. It's American embassies being targeted all over the world and the continuing aftermath of our ambassador being murdered this week in Libya along with three other Americans. But there's a lot else that happened today in the news. There's a ton to get to in tonight's show, including a surprise ruling out of Wisconsin that has overturned Republican Governor Scott Walker's union stripping law there, and a surprise ruling in Virginia on Republican efforts to effectively ban abortion in the state of Virginia, and another surprise ruling today, shutting down a big voter purge planned by a Republican Secretary of State in one of the nine swing states that both presidential campaigns believe is going to decide this election. That is all ahead this hour, all from today's news. It is a very big show. Uh, but we start with tonight's top story, and, and with a decision made in March 2003, which is when then-President George W. Bush ordered the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq. March 2003 is also the month when it was ordered that the flag-draped coffins of American service members killed abroad could not be photographed when those coffins got back to the United States. That change in policy under George W. Bush was a source of anger and controversy. It is why coffins were sometimes used in anti-Iraq war protests to visually represent those real caskets of Americans killed in the war that the Bush administration would not allow the country to see. The Bush administration banned the media from showing those dignified transfer ceremonies as the invasion of Iraq started in 2003. And they kept the policy in place throughout George W. Bush's time in office as the country waged two of the longest wars in our history. It was not until a new president replaced George W. Bush that the ban was rescinded. On Thursday, February 26, 2009, just five weeks after President Barack Obama was inaugurated, the Defense Department lifted the ban. And one week after the ban was lifted, the following Thursday, the media was allowed to cover that solemn return ceremony for the first time in a long time. And maybe it is because we did go so long as a country without seeing images like this that we are a little rocked back on our heels when we do see these images. Today was the transfer ceremony at Andrews Air Force Base just outside Washington, D.C., at which the bodies of the four Americans killed in Libya this week were brought home. It was the middle of the afternoon on an unusually busy news day with a million other things going on in American news and politics, but it was like time just stopped. We will wipe away our tears, stiffen our spines, and face the future undaunted. And we will do it together, protecting and helping one another, just like Sean Tyrone, Glenn, and Chris always did. May God bless them and grant their families peace and solace. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The flagged they served under now carries them home. May God bless the memory of these men who lay down their lives for us all. May God watch over your families and all who love them. And may God bless these United States of America. At this incredibly somber ceremony at Andrews Air Force Base today, uh, remarks from both Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and President Obama at a time when both Mr. Obama and Mrs. Clinton as head of the State Department and they have, they have to do things like addressing the nation while also managing in a hands-on way what is an ongoing and significant crisis for the country. Protests at U.S. embassies grew and spread today in Egypt, in Iraq, in India, in Bangladesh, in Turkey, in Pakistan, in Kuwait, in Syria, where you might think they'd have other things on their minds, in Afghanistan, in Malaysia, in Nigeria, in Lebanon, where a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant was torched, uh, in Tunisia, where the U.S. Embassy compound was breached by protesters, but no personnel uh, were hurt in Tunisia, uh, in Qatar, in Bahrain, in Sudan. Here's Richard Engel reporting for NBC. U.S. diplomatic outposts now appear to be easy targets. In Yemen, for the second day, furious protesters tried to storm the embassy in Sana'a, burning American flags as riot police fire water cannons. Gunshots can be heard. 
Why? Because they say the U.S. isn't doing enough against the makers of that now infamous anti-Islam internet video. In Tunisia, demonstrators set fires by the U.S. Embassy gate. And in Sudan, protesters turned their rage on the British and German embassies. Those countries had nothing to do with the video, but they're foreign Western powers. And for the mob, that's close enough. In Cairo, the government called off massive planned demonstrations. The president went on television to urge calm. But clashes near the U.S. Embassy continued. Authorities had to build a wall to block an access road. This has clearly moved beyond demonstrations against an offensive internet video. It's become an opportunity for radicals in many countries to express their anger with the United States. And they've learned from watching each other that U.S. diplomatic facilities overseas aren't as protected as they thought. I asked a group why the clashes are continuing, even though U.S. officials have criticized the video. Not enough, they say. That the response from the United States was late. I mean, the Hillary Clinton, Obama, all of your government, it was very late. So all of this is because the response was late? But there was little time for interviews. Well, we should uh, turn around here. The police are charging. Here. You see what happened? What the, the Egyptian government is doing with the Egyptian people because... There were demonstrations today in nearly 40 cities across the region and beyond. But as bad as it looks, the demonstrations were generally small. But in what will have implications for embassy security worldwide, extremists have found a weak spot to attack a superpower they believe is responsible for an offense against Islam. That was Richard Engel, NBC's chief foreign correspondent today, reporting from Cairo. Uh, President Obama earlier this week had ordered a detachment of 50 U.S. Marines to go shore up security at the American Embassy in Libya in Tripoli. Now the administration says it's also going to send a similar-sized detachment of Marines to our embassy in Sudan and to our embassy in Yemen. The president sent a statement about the deployment to Congress today, which he's supposed to do under the War Powers Resolution. The statement was sent early in the day. It was about Libya and Yemen then, but now that the decision has been made to also send Marines to Sudan, presumably the statement will be amended to also include that third country. The statement says, although these security forces are equipped for combat, these movements have been undertaken solely for the purpose of protecting American citizens and property. It also says these newly deployed Marines will stay deployed, quote, until the security situation becomes such that they are no longer needed. For now, of course, that means indefinitely. Uh, we should also point out that aside from these fast deploying units of Marines fanning out to these three countries, FBI agents are being sent specifically to Libya to investigate the murder of the American ambassador there and the three other Americans who were killed. The FBI. I mean, even though we think of the FBI as a domestic agency, it is the FBI that is the part of the U.S. government with that, that, that has the authority to investigate deaths of Americans in all other parts of the world. FBI did it in the embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, and the USS Hole bombing in 2000, and the Mumbai bombings in India in 2008, and now the FBI is investigating in Libya, or at least we're told they are on their way. The FBI being dispatched to Libya is yet another reminder that what happened in Libya appears to be a different kettle of fish than what is happening at all the other embassies and other U.S. sites around the world today. The attack that killed the U.S. ambassador in Libya appears to have been a coordinated military-style assault by well-armed men who arrived at the scene quite separately from any civilian protest. Given the militant groups that are known to operate in the area of Benghazi and the types of attacks for which those groups have claimed credit in the past, intelligence officials now tell the Washington Post that the FBI's tentative conclusion, essentially their working hypothesis about what happened in Libya, is that that assault that killed our ambassador there, quote, was carried out by a group aligned with Al-Qaeda. And that is in contrast to the angry mobs of irate civilians who are menacing U.S. embassies around the world today. They have been riled up by reports of this 
crude anti-Muslim video that turned up on YouTube purporting to be a trailer for a longer anti-Muslim film. The origins of the film, of course, are murky. Nobody's actually even claiming credit for the film. But YouTube today restricted access to it in countries where anti-Muslim speech is restricted. And the U.S. continues to try to convince the world that just because some wingnut in America made this offensive thing, that does not mean that the U.S. government has anything to do with it. Nor does it mean that the government approves of it. Nor does it mean that the government should be blamed for its existence. We've seen rage and violence directed at American embassies over an awful internet video that we had nothing to do with. It is hard for the American people to make sense of that because it is senseless and it is totally unacceptable. You can hear the frustration in Secretary of State Clinton's voice. She has reiterated this over and over and over and over again this week, and you can hear it every time she says it. How do you convince people of the truth here? Where do these conspiracy theories come from? And that brings us, weirdly, to what Paul Ryan did with his day today. In the midst of this worldwide conflagration targeting American interests and American personnel abroad because of insane conspiracy theories about the U.S. government and Islam, in the midst of that today, while it is ongoing, the Republican candidate for Vice President of the United States decided that today was the day to give a speech at an event called the Values Voter Summit. Now, for context here, the last time there were violent protests in Egypt targeting American diplomatic personnel in Egypt, the target was Hillary Clinton herself. Her motorcade was pelted by protesters in Alexandria in July. By, pelted by protesters who shouted at her and who called her... Look, look at this sign here that we've isolated. But Clinton... See what it says? Clinton is the supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood. Huh? A Wall Street Journal reporter trying at the time to track down what exactly made these Egyptian protesters so angry at Hillary Clinton back in July was directed by protesters and bloggers to go look at transcripts from American right-wing media. Transcripts of a guy named Jerry Boykin, a retired general, and a guy named Frank Gaffney explaining their cockamamie conspiracy theory that Hillary Clinton had secretly rigged the Egyptian elections to favor the Muslim Brotherhood. People in Egypt read that. They did not know the people who were talking were wing-nut right-wing conspiracy theorists. They believed what they were reading. They believed what they read. And they then attacked Hillary Clinton's motorcade in Egypt two months ago while calling her the Supreme Guide of the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, today, while American diplomats were again under siege in Egypt, Paul Ryan spoke at an event that also featured those right-wing conspiracy wingnut theorists, conspiracy theorists wingnuts, who got Hillary Clinton attacked in Egypt in July. See, there's Paul Ryan on the speaker list. Same event, also featuring Jerry Boykin, the former retired, uh, the retired general, and Frank Gaffney. Frank Gaffney has a 10-part DVD series called The Muslim Brotherhood in America, The Enemy Within. These were the guys who were saying Secretary of, Clint Secretary of State Clinton's Deputy Chief of Staff, Huma Abedin, Anthony Weiner's wife. Remember when they were saying she was all part of a Muslim Brotherhood plot to penetrate the U.S. government and destroy America? That's these guys. And that's whose event Vice Presidential nominee Paul Ryan spoke at today. The website Right Wing Watch also notes that Paul Ryan is featured on the program for this event right next to a man whose occupation, look at his occupation, see there? Author, comma, former terrorist. Oh, okay, that's true. It's, it's alphabetical, it's the way they lined up the speakers. So Paul Ryan is at the end of the R's, and he's right there alongside the guy who's at the start of the S's, a guy named Kamal Salim, former terrorist. As our embassies burned today, Paul Ryan spoke today at this event just a little while before Kamal Salim did. How do you change a terrorist? Introduce him to Jesus. How do you change a terrorist? Introduce him to Jesus. Uh, journalists who have looked into Kamal Salim uh, uniformly do not believe this guy actually is a former terrorist. One giveaway is that the FBI seems not at all interested in him. But he makes his living by telling right-wing Christian groups that he is a former terrorist. He also 
says that President Obama is secretly praying Islamic prayers when it looks like President Obama is pledging allegiance to the flag. He's not really pledging allegiance, he's secretly saying Islamic prayers. He also says President Obama is right now legalizing terrorism in America. He says if the United States passes immigration reform, I'm quoting him here, we'll be wearing ragheads. He says Roe versus Wade is how the United States is getting taken over by Sharia law. Roe versus Wade is Sharia law. That's what the man says. And that's where the Republican Party put its vice presidential nominee to speak today. That's how they decided to clean up after their presidential nominee this week denounced the U.S. Embassy in Cairo while the U.S. Embassy in Cairo was being attacked. I don't know if the Republican presidential campaign sees this kind of thing as winning or not. Maybe they do. Maybe they see this as their way to the White House. But whether or not it is winning, it is not helping. 